If you're new to the world of AI, all the terms in the lingo can definitely feel a little bit overwhelming, but no worries because today I'm going to simplify all of that for you in just seven minutes, believe it or not. So let's get started. First of all, we have to start off with large language models or LLMs. You might also hear these referred to as foundation models. These are the powerhouses that are resulting from a massive amount of compute and a ton of data and are very expensive to train. That's why only a handful of companies right now have the resources and the expertise to train these models. But once you have one of these models up and running, they drive a number of different and wide varying and exciting generative AI applications and use cases. I like to think of these LLMs as the engines of AI, just as a single type of engine, whether that's diesel or electric can power a train, a motorcycle or a car, these LLMs can be adapted to drive a number of different tasks and functions as well. One of the more popular use cases for LLMs has been the AI Assistant, and I'm sure that you've used one of these, namely ChatGPT, which put Gen AI on the map a year and a half ago. Now, ChatGPT is the UI or the application layer, but the engine, quote unquote, that powers ChatGPT is the GPT series of LLMs from OpenAI. Now, OpenAI will only give you access to the underlying engine, quote unquote, via the ChatGPT application or an API. An API is a way for developers to send their data to the OpenAI infrastructure and get a response from these models in a way to integrate them into a custom application. However, you're never going to see the underlying code or the model weights that drive these models as they are proprietary to OpenAI. So we call these models closed source models or third party LLMs. In contrast, there are LLM models where you can see the code and you can see the weights. We call these models open source LLMs and they might be a good option for highly specialized tasks or if you're very sensitive about your data staying within your infrastructure. Meta has come onto the scene big on this front with their Llama LLM series and Minstrel, the French AI company, has released some amazing LLMs that are open source as well. As I mentioned, the real magic in LLMs lies in their versatility. Just like an engine can power many different types of vehicles, these foundation models can be adapted to make a number of different AI applications as well. For example, we can use them to generate code, generate images, video, sound, and even music. These are all different types of modes that the LLM can handle. We say that an LLM is multimodal if it can handle multiple of these different types of medium, media types, and data types. For instance, we say that ChatGPT Pro is multimodal because you can talk to it, it can generate a voice, it can generate an image for you, it can generate code, and pretty soon it's going to be able to generate some really cool video. That brings me to the term generative AI or Gen AI as the cool kids like to say. What we're trying to get at with this term is the ability of these LLMs to produce new types of content that differs greatly from their training data and are much more customized to what the user is asking for. Whereas traditional AI methods seem very tied to the training data, generative AI applications appear much more creative and versatile in their overall output. This is fairly new technology that's driving this innovation and it's mostly driven by advancements such as transformers, generative adversarial networks, or GANs, and diffusion networks. As a result of this step change in AI, we as an industry have decided to recognize this as a new trend, namely generative AI or Gen AI. Now, as revolutionary and as powerful as these LLMs are, they do come with some risk and drawbacks that are unique to LLMs. For LLMs in particular, they are prone to what are called hallucinations. These are instances where the model is going to generate a response that sounds very confident but is either irrelevant, incorrect, or might actually be harmful. Also, there's a risk of what's called a prompt injection attack. So that's where a malicious actor tries to trick the LLM into divulging confidential information or into running a bad piece of code or just acting in an inappropriate way. Now, we as an industry are still formalizing our guardrails and best practices to hedge this particular type of risk. And I think we're making some good progress there. 
I hope that this was helpful. Do me a favor. If you enjoyed this video and you found it informative, please share it with someone that might benefit from this. I would really appreciate that. And if you're interested in a part two, make sure that you are following me on LinkedIn and on YouTube. Thanks and talk to you soon.